can you see the presentation? Yes, you can. Okay, so hi everyone, and uh, thank you for staying for this uh, last presentation. So this is about the 3D configuration of NEMO for the Caribbean region. So I will uh, go through the first part uh, until the break. So um, I will talk about the configuration of the NEMO model and the main inputs we are using and the kind of output you can look at and some of the validation you can do and a quick comparison of a run that includes rivers and non-rivers. So I will go, um, it will be quite quickly because some of the things have already been taught in the previous um, presentation. So as you know, uh, models are very handy to uh, provide information on the spa spatial and temporal coverage and they can allow you to assess past events and also assess future impacts. And obviously the degree of complexity of the model uh, depends mainly on the question you want to uh, answer. And the hydrodynamic fields that you can obtain from the model, you can use that to uh, particle tracking application. For example, for tracking sargassum or other particles like plastics or larvae. So this is the model domain, you've already seen it. And um, this is a map of the bathymetry. And for this model, so you need um, as input, obviously the bathymetry. And here, this is a, a resolution of 8.8 .8 kilometers with a 75 uh, depth level using the Sigma uh, Z partial steps level. And you can output um, SSH, current, temperature, and salinity. And here, uh, the red points uh, indicate the main river outflow that you can consider in this uh, domain. Um, because this is quite a, a big domain, um, you can have a lot of river flow. And this can be quite tricky to implement uh, in the model. Um, so as you see, the input is the bathymetry. And for the lateral boundaries for temperature and salinity, uh, we use the a global analysis uh, product from Copernicus. Um, so this is the platform that was introduced before by Judith. And we use the tidal forcing. And for the surface sourcing, we use ERA5, um, also downloaded from uh, the CDS uh, Copernicus platform. And as a work in progress is the implementation of the rivers. Um, we have only been able to run a few years because we run into instabilities. So we are working on that. So we will only show you the first year of uh, results, including the rivers. And as outputs, so you can output many variables, but the main ones are SSH, current, salinity, uh, temperature, and mix layer. That's the one we will um, present. So for the validation, um, so this uh, figure was already presented by Judith, and you can uh, compare with observation. For, for the sea level, you can use tide gauge. Um, data and uh, for other variables like the temperature, you can use a satellite observation. So here, this is um, a quick comparison of um, the observation. So this is the middle figure from MODIS. So this is for um, three different months of the year of 2009. This is when we started the, the simulation. And uh, this is the comparison for SST, so between MODIS and the uh, river runs on the top and the non-river runs uh, below. So we can't really see uh, clear differences um, for the SST. So this is the, 
the same, the comparison between the river and the non-rivers uh, for different seasonal parts of the year for 2010. Um, so we can see the main currents, the Caribbean flow uh, that is well simulated uh, by the model. And again here, this is um, for the current speed. Uh, so we can't really see a big difference between the, the river and the non-river runs, but we can um, uh, better see it for the salinity. Uh, so mainly at the uh, river outflow. So on the Orinoc, you can clearly see this uh, output of fresh water when you consider the river's uh, implementation. And you can also see uh, a very uh, lower salinity values around the Mississippi outflow. Yeah, and this is the comparison uh, when you consider the mixed layer depths. Um, so you can mainly see during winter a deepening of the mixed layer um, for both of the simulation and the summer um, and during summer uh, mixed layer that gets uh, uh, reduced. Um, so for most of the variables we looked at, we couldn't really see a big difference in the uh, between the river and the non-river runs, but only for the salinity, only the salinity effect was more visible. So this is the the main average for each seasonal part of the year, so you can better quantify the difference. Yeah, so um, the river implementation is still in work, but we have a longer run uh, that doesn't include the rivers. And um, Marta will talk to you more about that to look at the entire annual variability um, on this run. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I don't know if you really need a break or if we can just follow through directly. So I think the break at the minute is just um, to, to allow you to switch over and if there's any questions at this stage from anyone. Valerie, have you applied any research to the sargassum on this? I, I think that's probably coming in a couple of days or whatever, but. Um, uh, so we just have a few figures where Mata will talk a little bit about um, sargassum, but we haven't really looked deeply into that on the link with uh, sargassum. Okay, so if there are questions. Oh, carry on then. Yeah, I have a question. Um, when it comes to model development, how much of it, how much of it is doing um is solving the numerical equation, the um, you know, the finite element finite element equations and how much of it is done based on observation? Well, when when you use Nemo, you don't really go in deeply into the equation uh, setup. Um, what you really work on is on the choice of your inputs and the resolution of your inputs. And um, yeah, I don't know. Oh. I think if, if I can tip in the observations Enter also because you need to validate your model. You need to make sure that your model is reproducing what you want it to reproduce. And it's what uh, what Valerie saw with the comparison with the tight gauges and with the satellite data. I don't know if you can go backwards, Valerie, maybe. So when, when we run the models, the, the equations and the numerical methods are implemented in the model but we are not really solving ourselves the equation. It's the model who is doing this. And the observations enter so that we can 
we can make sure that the model is performing correctly. I don't know if, if I explain myself properly or not, or if I answer really your question. Uh, yes, I was just trying to understand the process. So what, what we do with the models is, uh, uh, we, we have the, um, we have the input files and the boundary conditions. And I don't know if, I mean, this is, this is maybe a bit, uh, can I help in a way? I just, um, I think I understand what the questioner wants to know, but I mean, we have um, a lot of choices about implementing the model in terms of the forcing data and the parameterization. There are different parameterizations that can be used. So it's a, it's a skilled job in order to just run the model, but you're not, you're not redeveloping the model. But in some cases, you might be looking at new processes and implementing them in the model. As uh, Marta was, uh, as, as Valerie was saying, the, the, the rivers aren't, um, are obviously not a trivial thing to get working fully in the model. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're doing model development, but you're not, you're not writing the whole model from scratch. So what you're actually doing is, is um, you have to have quite a lot, as I say, background knowledge and skill to do this. And you're, you're running a complicated model, so you need to know a lot. And it doesn't always work the first time. So you have to do a lot of, uh, of work in setting it up, but not actually, you're not, you're not generating a new model every time. Is that any clearer? <laughs> Sorry if it's not. Yeah, I think I understand what you're saying, Dr. Wolf. Um, thank you. I was just trying to get a feel of what goes into actually some of these um, predictive models and um, how they work. Yes. Uh, if that, um, yeah, and that, if that, um, and if there are factors that goes into their accuracy as well. Yes, and I, I've just put in the chat as well that I will be talking a bit about interpreting model outputs on Thursday because it's, it is um, they're a research tool, but they're also an operational forecasting tool. So I want to talk about that issue of, you know, how much can you trust a model and so on. Um, for the benefit of somebody who's not going to be running these models themselves, but, you know, you can get the outputs and, and what, how much trust can you put in them. So I hope that'll help. I'm going to shut up and... Yeah, I'm just going to add that um, working with this kind of model, like uh, Nemo, you don't really go deep into the coding, like uh, implementation, implementing stuff into Fortran. So you mainly work with like a name list where you can, um, this is more friendly, so you can easily set up um, the parameterization. Uh, so including the river for this, for example, is just turning on a variable on, and then you provide some input files for the river. So you need a that data set of either seasonal variation of river flow or international variation of river flow. And then you can add this uh, file into um, your run. So it's a lot of working with just a name list that already uh, configure most of the part uh, for you, yeah. That's it. It's, it's, okay, yeah. so I will be focusing on the, on the results of the, um, of the NEMO 3D run without rivers because uh, we are still working on getting the river, the river uh, not running into instabilities, but we think that still we can get some useful information in runs without rivers, because as, as we saw with what Valerie um, uh, just saw, most of the differences that we observe 
are actually in the sea surface salinity. We don't see very striking differences in the mixed layer depth or in the currents or, or in the sea surface temperature. So, so we think that even if not perfect and any model, it's no model is going to be perfect. We can still gather some useful, some useful information. And so all of these runs on, on NEMO are basically to provide the hydrodynamics fields for particle tracking. And, and what we've been doing is a preliminary analysis on, on interannual variability. So we are going to have a look at the average year and the anomalies. And we also had a look at the seasonal variability and, and we are going to focus on, on two extreme cases. So in, in 2013, that there was no sarcasm bloom and in 2015, that there was sarcasm bloom. So, uh, we calculate the interannual variability, so we got an, we calculate an average year. Uh, but the limitation that we have here is that even if we've been running the uh, the model basically until yesterday, we we have a very short record. So so this is only rep an average representative of the last seven years. So if uh, if there have been extreme events, we may not have on either side of, of four rounds, we, we may not be getting everything. So we have this, uh, this uh, the first one that you see is the uh, average year temperature. So we have temperatures ranging uh, for the average year between 20 and 30 degrees. We also have the, uh, average mix layer depth uh, that is going to indicate uh, as until how far down in the water column uh, the, um, the water column is, uh, is well mixed. Uh, we also have the average uh, year salinity and we also have the average year current uh, that we have currents that go up to two meters per second, more or less and that it does reproduce the, the general features of the circulation. And this is useful because we are going to be able to, to compare if it wants to move to the next slide. No, yeah. So we can, what, uh, what we can do once we have the average year, that is this first one here, we can compare with uh, all of the years of our, of our um, record. But just looking like this, it doesn't give you very much information. So we can calculate the anomalies. So we calculate the difference between the, the average year and the, each one of the years that we have. And so what we did was do the average year minus the year that we want to calculate. And this is going to mean that when we have positive values that are red values, uh, the average year is going to be warmer than the year we are at. So for instance, in uh, 2011, that pretty much everything is, is red or average year is warmer. And then 2011 was, um, was uh, cooler. In this way, we see more the, the differences between the average year and the, um, and each one of the years. But if if we look at the um, at the color scale, we are still only having differences of about one degree between one year and another. So the differences are really not very not very striking from one year to to another. We can do similar for the salinity. So we have our average year and then each one of the years. And again, we are not having really, really uh, big uh, differences in, in anomalies in, in, the, um, in each one of, of the years in terms of, of salinity. Uh, similar than before, the positive values, so red values mean that the 
average year is more saline than the year that we are we are looking at. And we have values of salinity ranging in the area between 30 and 38 PSU, and we are having differences in salinity between the different years. The anomalies are inferior to, to one PSU, so it's basically less than, than 10% differences. And if we look at the currents, we can see that we do have some different patterns, but it's nothing really striking. The, the interannual variability doesn't seem to be very, very striking. And similarly for the mixer year depth, that is going to give us an, an indication of how stratified is the, is the water column. We don't see there very striking differences between, between the, the different years. And when we look at the um, at the uh, at the aggregated values for the so these are the mean values for all of the region, and we get one value for each one of the years. In terms of sea surface temperature, the in all of the graphs, the the brownish uh, line is going to be the average year, and each one of the years is indicated by the um, by a blue circle. And in any of the parameters, we see very striking differences in, in terms of interannual variability. But since we had seen in from, uh, from model satellite image that, that there is a difference between, uh, between some of the years, like in 2013, there was no sargassum bloom and it seemed to be slightly less saline and colder than the average year. And in 2015, when there was a, a big sargassum bloom, it was more saline and there was also a, a dipole on temperatures. We decided that maybe we could, the seasonality in each one of these years could explain some of the, of the differences. So we did similarly than, than before and uh, so on the top one, the top uh, line, you have the, I'm going to start better by the middle one. So the middle one is the average year. The color schemes are the same that they had been so far. So here we have sea surface um, temperature. Uh, I'm seeing that there is one question. Uh, one degree. Yes, it might it might mean that we are looking by agree, by looking at higher um, by looking at averaging over a larger scale, we may be missing the higher frequencies. Uh, so the middle line is the average um, the average year in terms of sea surface temperature. On the top is 2013, the anomalies to to that year. Uh, that there was no sargassum bloom and on the bottom is the anomalies in 2015 where there was sargassum bloom. So the largest sargassum blooms are during spring and, and summer. And the pattern that, do, that we observe in the anomalies in, in sea surface uh, temperature is very different from, from in 2013 and in 2015. So in, in 2013, the, we have red colors, which means that the anomaly is positive. And, and this means that the sea surface temperature that year in 2013 was cooler than the, um, than the average year. Whereas in 2015, we have a dipole, the lower part uh, is, um, the half southern part of the of the plot is cooler than the northern part that is uh, that is warmer. I should have done the color scheme the other way around because it's absolutely counterintuitive. I'm very sorry. Um, we can look also at the. I'm sorry, my computer is being is slow and is. Uh, we also look at, at uh, anomalies in sea surface uh, salinity for each one of the um, of the seasons, and the pattern is much more complex. 
than the than it was the one for the sea surface temperature, but the anomalies again seem to be reversed between 2013 and 2015. And in terms of of uh, of current speed, we see some difference with with uh, this detaching in in 2013 and them being continued, but the differences are not really really striking. And in terms of the of the mix layer depth, uh, again the differences are not really really striking between 2013 and and 2015. And when we look at the at the aggregated uh, the mean value for all of the areas, so the the circles represent 2013, the squares are 2015, and the stars are the average year. So the in terms of sea surface temperature, well, for all of the variables, we can see that if we compare to the variables that we obtain for the interannual variability, the range of variability that we have in at seasonal scales is, is quite much larger than, than it was for the interannual variability. And for the sea surface temperature, uh, 2013 was cooler than 2015. In terms of, of uh, mixed layer depth, uh, 2013 is, is slightly deeper mixed layer depth, so, so more less stratified in the, in the upper um, part of the water column. It is less saline in 2013, and, and 2013 is also closer to the average year than, than 2015. That seems to be quite more saline, and 2015 is, uh, has a stronger currents than than 2013 and then the average year had. So to, to summarize, we what we observe with this very preliminary study is that uh, the seasonal variability is, is larger than the interannual variability. In, in, in average, 2013 is less saline and, and colder than the average year, and 2015, on the other hand, is, is more saline and it has uh, a dipole in, in the temperatures. The stratification and the circulation patterns are, are complex, but overall there are stronger currents in 2015 than they were in 2013. And the, the mixed layer depth is deeper in 2013, whereas it is shallower in 2015. The seasonal variability follows the same the same pattern that it does the interannual variability, but it's uh, with a stronger uh, differences. And, and this is basically the, the basis for, for, particle, for particle tracking this, this um, hydrodynamic fields is what is fed into the, into the particle tracking. And here we try to, to find indexes or justifications uh, for why on, on base on physical parameters on, on why those two years had contrasting behavior, but but you can also apply this to plastics or to, to larvae dispersal. And I think that's pretty much.